Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Mr. Jeffrey Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else. If you are watching on YouTube right now, you will know that today is the best day of my life because it is the first time that we are using our new podcast mics. I'm still kind of uh, using it through an older software, so I'm trying to become an audio technician and get much better with it. So give us a couple times. Uh, that's the problem is when we record, we meet up and we record three in a row. So if I don't like the audio or the quality of it in one of them, that means that you know for the rest of the week, uh, the ones that I upload are also gonna sound kind of crappy, but uh, we got new mics, super pumped about it. Hey Jeff, do you know who Michael Jackson is? Because he recorded Thriller using these microphones. You ever heard of him? Yes. And we're using it for our podcast. It's so funny. When I listen to other people's podcasts, I could always tell when they have the sure mics. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to some friends about it and they're like, dude, I, I don't hear what you're complaining about in the podcast. It sounds fine, but I hear it and I just listen and I have to edit the audio so much and stuff where it bothers me if it's not up to the, to the quality that I wanted. But when I listen to other people's podcasts, I'm like, I could tell without even watching on video or anything that they have a sure mic. So we got them. Uh, bear with us. Super pumped about it. Um, and what's cool is, look, we got these like stand things. Now I could like, mm -hmm. I'm like mobile. I could like move around and stuff. I don't have those, the arms in the way anymore. So look at that. Three years in and uh, finally got new podcast mics. So congratulations. That's what happens. That's what happens when you start to, you know, do well or whatever. You just start to spend money and that's where companies get into issues, right? Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's the problem new microphones yeah and yeah on new microphones so in today's podcast we are going to continue on with our capital allocation series our friend jacob mcdonough sent over a pdf copy of his book if you have not um uh, watched or listened to any of the other podcasts that we've done on this make sure you go and do that there is a playlist on youtube um uh, go buy the book i'm gonna put the link in the description jacob mcdonough capital allocation the financials of a new england textile mill it's a great book uh follow him on twitter um he's allowed us to do a series on all of buffett's early investments with berkshire so we're having a lot of fun doing it so thank you to jacob um and in today's podcast we're gonna be talking about geico okay and geico and buffett go way back 1951 1951 that's right if you're watching on the screen right now he wrote an article called the security i like best by warren buffett look at buffett that's a young buffett right there isn't it mm -hmm. and he wrote about geico what was it trading at like 15 times earnings 10 times earnings at the time i know he says it in here i've read this a couple different times but he went through um why he thinks geico is a great company and why it's a security that he likes best. Um, what originally got him interested in Geico? Ben Graham was the chairman. That's right. And was it through being in class? No, he, he found that out. Who's who? Which what? is a book which tells you information about famous people. Well, not famous, semi well known people. Um, it's a way of figuring out. Uh, connections between people and things like that before LinkedIn and stuff. That's what you would do. So that was the version books. of LinkedIn Kind of yeah, I mean to, what boards do people sit on and things like that? Yeah, sure And that was how he learned about Geico mm -hmm. Yeah, and then what did he do from there? He went to Washington DC uh, He Yeah, he Bang pounded on the, on the door the janitor let him in apparently and he talked to a Lormer Davidson um, who was the uh, head of Geico at the time, but he had been involved with Geico from um, selling the piece uh, that the founders wanted to sell, and that piece ended up being bought by um, Ben Graham's partnership, uh, and then Graham ended up spinning it off. Yeah, which is what he did often, right? When I mean, he really ran if his fund like a hedge fund. Well, they would send capital back. Well, he yeah, exactly, more like Walter Schloss, I think, uh, that normally you'd send capital back, but you couldn't because you know he wanted to own. I mean, they bought a huge chunk of Geico, so basically, that would have dwarfed um, most of the rest of the fund. Yeah, and if they just kept Geico while they, I mean, they wouldn't have been allowed to anyway. But if they just kept Geico while um, you know shrinking the keeping the fund the same size over time. Um, then yeah, Geico would have become by far most of it. Mm -hmm. So he wrote that article in 1951 and then uh, Geico 
came back into his life in the 1970s. Why do do you know when he sold it? So he bought it in 1951. In like a year or something. Yeah, they say in the snowball. It yeah, like a pretty quick. Because he he uh, bought um, an insurance company after that. Another insurance company that was trading at I think one times earnings maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, no, 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 less than one times. Yeah. Let's see. So he invested ten thousand two hundred eighty-two dollars, and Jacob goes into it in the book uh, into Geico at just under thirty dollars per share. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I said what you said that he sold his shares the following year after the stock price increased nicely, and he did uh, like a little analysis on it. He said if you he had held the stock for those twenty-seven years, um, the ten thousand two hundred eighty-two dollar investment would have been worth about one point three million which yeah. is the compounded annual return of 27% per year. Pretty yeah, nice. that, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. not bad. Uh, and that's what Geico would have done if he had held on to it. Now he did even better. And in his personal money, he did a lot better. Mm -hmm. You know, he talks about his partnership there. But in his personal money, we know he did probably a lot better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Geico, what was it that was different about Geico from other insurance companies at the time? So Geico stands for Government Employees Insurance Company. And uh, it has a approach that's similar to USAA, where it focuses on one group. And I mean, originally, we're talking about Geico originally. Um, and so it did direct uh, mail uh, preferred risk in the sense that these were government employees. And it provided auto insurance that way, which is obviously was a growing part of the um, market for a while. And so like what the perception was, if you're going to underwrite government employees, they're probably not like 16 year olds driving crazy on the road. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of different ways that you could figure out. Some people are lower risk than others. People who take a government job are capping how much money they can ever make. Uh, for a lot of security and for sometimes higher starting wages, the same as military, right? So the upside is uh, limited. You're not going to make a lot of money by being in the highest levels of government or military. Um, and so usually it's focused on people who uh, have a lower risk profile than certain other jobs. I mean, insurance companies don't ask certain questions that just because they'd be kind of uh, invasive and stuff and people wouldn't approve of them. But there are ways to ask questions that you could get a pretty good idea of someone's risk taking and risk taking is pretty highly correlated across all aspects of life. So you could guess that someone is likely to be more dangerous as a driver, more dangerous as a credit risk, all sorts of things just by figuring out certain things about um, the, you know, their approach to risk and other aspects of their life. And one easy way of doing that, of course, is with the government employees thing, just like the military thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so Jacob writes, as of 1975, Geico's expense ratio had not exceeded 16.5% for 30 years. For a few decades leading up to this period, the property and casualty insurance industry as a whole averaged an expense ratio of 36.9% for stock companies. So, I mean, as you could see, like, it reminds me of a bank that way. When it comes to, like, uh, efficiencies and stuff like right. that. Right. So, a huge advantage from direct distribution. So, uh, 20 percent of premiums 20 cents in the dollar it was saving um and actually that's why people thought that it would never succeed against competitors because they were selling through agents whereas guy could sold directly it did not sell through agents at all mm -hmm. um and that's the big potential advantage uh it was very small though compared to the competitors they had gotten a lot more people um so they had fairly small market share right mm -hmm. yeah have you ever owned a company sold it and then ended up buying it later for one reason or another. Right. I don't think so. And that's why I warn people about that. They always think they're going to buy it back. I would say that you generally don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, th I just thought it was interesting. I mean, so he's clearly, he's followed the company for a very long time. Right. I have followed companies for a long time and then bought them. Uh, once something happened to them that I've done many times. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, it's like how many years did Buffett read of Coca-Cola before actually buying into the company? years yeah and um sometimes i follow companies for a long time before buying them yeah that's absolutely true and that's the hard part about investing which we talk a lot about right is you may be doing a lot of work today that's not actionable to your portfolio today but it really is actionable like just being productive on from like an overall investor standpoint yeah uh, and Buffett had owned an insurance company by this point. In fact, they had, had uh, probably by these years, let's see, that guy goes happening. They had done Urban Auto, right? They had tried that, uh, which was not very successful. 
They were in like uh, successful in one city, and then they tried to expand to other cities and had real problems underwriting. So, and National Indemnity did uh, car insurance too. So mm-hmm. there, there was definitely auto insurance that Berkshire had done, and Berkshire was no Geico in terms of their insurance underwriting. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so let's see. So it says, although Geico enjoyed many advantages, so like on the cost side, what we were just talking about, uh, the business was almost ruined in the mid 1970s. The company underpriced its policies at a time when it had too much operating leverage. This led to huge losses, nearly wiping out the shareholders. On the verge of bankruptcy, Buffett stepped in and invested in Geico once again. So I guess you mm-hmm. take this situation where it's had years of success, right? And then they run into some issues. And you've talked a lot about this, like with insurance companies, right? Where yeah. it's like, okay, well, are they just going to change what they're doing, uh, you know, going forward, so they could, I guess, move past whatever issues they're having. Like, so this led to Buffett getting a, uh, an interesting opportunity to buy into the company. And then it's really like, how are they going to go from there? Right. The big issue here would have been our regulators going to um, shut it down. So Geico was basically insolvent. Um, it had insufficient capital. And um, theoretically, regulators might shut it down. Um, not just theoretically. Normally, they would. Uh, however, from a theoretical perspective of like what actually is likely to survive in the long run and stuff geico is fine you don't really earn your money on your capital just like in banking you you know banks earn money on deposits geico earns money on the premiums that it has and um as long as you change your underwriting which wouldn't be impossible to do uh you'd make a lot of money they had a huge advantage over other insurance companies in terms of the much lower expense ratio there's no reason why they wouldn't have really strong earning power but it is true that given their capital levels regulators would say it's not safe for you to write because you might not be able to pay off your policyholders. And for that reason, even though you're likely to have enough earning power to justify having a much higher market capitalization stuff than you're trading at, um, then they shut them down, you know? And uh, I I think a lot of people um, complain about Geico as one of the special deals for, for Buffett. It's the first one I think that people point to where he had the preferred stock deals and things like Solomon and stuff is the Geico one. Um, because, you know, uh, he kind of made an argument to keep the company going and all of that when it's true that if it was another insurer, it probably would have been shut down. Oh yeah. So I was going to say, so would you know exactly? So he, he did say that the company underpriced its policies. I mean, why were they doing that? Was that really just to buy business basically? So they wanted to grow and then there was extreme inflation at this point. So there's serious inflation in terms of um, uh, what we call social inflation, what they call insurance industry, social inflation, which basically means larger um, uh, judgments in court cases and things like that. Uh, Sure, there were a lot of young people um, that were just getting policies for the first time and stuff within a few years of this, uh, so that it just started. But And then there was just heavy inflation and policies weren't being repriced fast enough. So those are all factors to consider. Um, Buffett knew that, and I think um, actually he spoke to people at Geico, uh, the previous management before he bought in, um, to warn them that their reserves were insufficient. So um, insurers like banks take reserves and then charge off those reserves over time, uh, you know, paying out actually, which doesn't match up with the earnings that you're seeing. So the earnings that you're seeing are really adjustments to reserves. Um, so what happens is a company can look like it has good earnings by just not growing its reserves adequately. And so if they're moving into insuring different kinds of people, um, they should be reserving more against their, um, against for your, you know, you should see that number rising more and they may not have been doing that, which would lead to overboard earnings in the first place. And then it's kind of like not having enough capital because in a sense you could take tangible equity that you have in a business, right? A bank or insurer and add also to that their loan loss reserves, their claims reserves. Um, And those together are really your cushion to absorb things. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times people say that a company has a lot of uh, equity capital or whatever is well capitalized. That may be true, but maybe their reserves aren't sufficient. And he felt like those reserves weren't sufficient. How do you judge that when looking at a bank or insurance company? Uh, What kind of loans and what kind of underwriting are they doing versus uh, how big are the um, reserves that they have as a percent compared to other people? Um, Also, you could have it 
for banks, for instance, how big are the reserves versus the amount of non-performing assets and things like that. So some have very large reserves versus non-performing assets while others don't. Um, sometimes there are other hints. Uh, I wrote up Investor's Title Insurance Company. I felt there were some hints that maybe they had had a lot of reserves previously. I don't know if that's true exactly, but like my feeling from looking at in the development of reserves over time, what happened um, is that they kind of weren't reserving more now because they had probably over reserved. Um, and you can see there's a, um, you can see different things in the 10 Ks of these companies, but you can look at how losses developed over time, having to do with what years they were in and then what they expected those losses to be and what they turned out to be over time. Um, Geico's writing auto insurance, so it's, um, those claims are, they're resolved one way or the other pretty quickly um, within a matter of a few years usually, longer than you would think because of litigation and stuff, but still quick compared to other kinds of insurance. So a lot of it happens within just the first year and then within three years, you basically probably have most of it settled. Mm -hmm. Um, I like this from 1976 Geico's annual report. Your management firmly believes that the quickest way for Geico to return to underwriting profitability is to do what the company has traditionally done best. Therefore, Geico is concentrated heavily on attracting and selectively underwriting high quality insurance risks, primarily through direct marketing methods. Yeah. I mean, they Geico combines the two things that we've talked about before in uh, banking, and it's also true in insurance, but um, what you want is low costs because then you're able to take low risks, right? Mm -hmm. You actually, without low costs, it's actually pretty hard to take low risks. Um, and so that can help you that way. That doesn't mean that's the only kind of insurance that you can write. Geico is a big competitor today, at least as successful as them, and it started out on the other side of things. Progressive actually started in the riskiest part of the insurance business for for car insurance. Geico started in the preferred and they progressive started in the non-standard and over time they've moved together. Um, so you can do either one, uh, but it, in either case you want to have really low costs and having those really low costs allow you to you know, be able to um, have profitability even when you're pricing things similar to what other people would be. But as you saw when they moved into um, taking other kinds of risks, they still ran into trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even with the cost advantage that they had, which is something worth thinking about. I mean, they could have priced their policies similarly. Uh, I mean, they could have taken similar risks to other companies and priced their policies below them and taken business over time. So how aggressive they were was really aggressive because they had that big advantage over these companies that had agents. And so over time, you would think that they would win people a new business, and presumably they were taking a larger share of new business, um, even though their market share might not have been huge. So they really wanted to grow, basically, if they were doing that. Yeah. Berkshire first invested in the common stock of Geico in 1976 at an average cost of $3.18 per share. Later that year, Berkshire also paid $9.77 per share for the preferred stock that Geico mm -hmm. issued. Berkshire invested $4.1 million in the common stock and $19.4 million into the preferred stock. Is that not Buffett right there? Majority of it in the preferred stock. Uh, one share of the preferred stock was convertible into two shares of common stock. Following these investments, Berkshire owned 15.4% of Geico at a cost of $23.5 million. And he wanted to buy more. Uh, he backstopped the deal. It was uh, underwritten by Solomon and wanted to buy more. So he would have been willing to take a lot bigger amount. And although this was a preferred convertible, I believe that because of how quickly the price rebounded, the, the fact that it was preferred became pretty irrelevant to the price of it as a security. Because once you're so far into being converted, um, once you're so far above the price at which you would convert, um, then owning a preferred is basically like owning a common. What do you think Buffett was looking at? in this situation like if you were in his you know shoes or if you're watching this from you know the outside i mean what do you think he just was if thinking? it would survive mm -hmm. i think it was like bank of america he talked about wells fargo bank of america he looked at them and looked at their pre-provision uh income right so before charge-offs and stuff so looking at geico he's saying okay how much can they make if they just get their loss ratio down to a reasonable amount a lot i mean uh just a ton and uh, versus the price that i'm paying so will this thing survive and this is one of the riskiest investments he's ever made. I mean, I think he's quoting the snowball as saying to someone, I just made an investment today that could go to zero. I could lose everything tomorrow. And that's true if they hadn't been able to raise capital. 
So, I mean, it's one of those interesting things. Like, you read all these books about whether it's banks or insurers or whatever, and they say, well, we could have made it through if we just ran, you know, it was a liquidity thing, not a, not a asset quality thing or an insolvency thing that we had, really, if they hadn't pulled the plug on us. This is the kind of example of a company that um, it could earn a lot and it had a better model, right? Mm -hmm. So, if it did underwrite correctly, it would be successful. But on the other hand, if we look at the premiums they were writing versus their equity and all that kind of stuff, it was in a very dangerous position um, relative to what how much protection it was offering policyholders. So without Berkshire's backing, without Buffett's backing, and the whole insurance industry got involved in this bailout, um, I, it would have been hard to do. I mean, you couldn't continue. So I, I mean, I think it was writing at at least double, around double probably the amount of underwriting leverage that Progressive uses now. And I don't know how much Geico uses exactly, but um, that's significantly risky. And it's and, and already car insurers like Geico and Progressive underwrite at pretty, very high premiums volumes relative to equity compared to other kinds of insurance. So there are insurers that are, um, Geico was writing probably six times more premiums to three to six times more in premiums versus equity than many property and casualty insurers you'll look at. And um, it was definitely double what car insurers probably do and should write at. Who was the CEO of Geico at the time? I don't remember who the CEO was at the time. I mean, at the time, I believe he was, uh, Geico, I believe he was out at the time that Buffett, when Buffett was looking to invest, they didn't have a CEO, or I don't know if they brought in an interim person or what. Um, it's probably described in the book. Um, because he his biggest thing was he talked to Jack Byrne in um, for a few hours, and that was the really big thing. I think that made him ha have the decision to to go with him. Um, we've talked about that before, where I said like you know in terms of management and things, would you make a decision on management purely on management? And the only things I would was be insurance and banking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they made huge changes. I mean, Geico left New Jersey. When I was growing up and stuff, Geico ad said available, blah, blah, blah. And then at the bottom, not available in New Jersey. And I forget if it was Massachusetts or Illinois or something that they also didn't do. But they were basically in all states except for a couple. And New Jersey was one of them. And they once had a really big business in New Jersey. But New Jersey was kind of infamous for being a difficult insurance market. Um, Why is that? Uh, I don't know all the details on that one. I mean, I know how it developed over time and that some government intervention and stuff made it a little more difficult. But... Um, I mean, Berkshire had trouble with the urban auto business, too. So you have to be careful. Uh, it also is a question of regulation stuff. You know, insurance regulation is... I don't know. I get a lot of questions from you about, like, well, this accounting thing or the, who's their auditor, who's whatever. Insurance regulators, sometimes it's by state, and they're sometimes pretty serious. Um, I was reading the book about uh, the, uh, AIG financial products, right? Fatal risk. Mm -hmm. And if you really pay attention at the end of AIG's run there, um, the actual timeline of what happens is like in many cases, when I was reading about the failure of uh, Penn square and stuff like that, they kind of talk to the fed and say, well, should we shut it down? Whatever, like the FDIC. And they kind of let it go for a while. That's not what happened with AIG. They basically told the fed, I'm just giving you a heads up where going in and we're shutting down the their insurance subsidiaries in the state. I think it was Texas was going to do it. Um, that just happened to be where their insurance subsidiaries were. But, yeah, they want to protect policyholders. And you can look at the AM best ratings and all that. Um, and writing a lot of premiums versus equity can be risky for that and could cause them to fail uh, to pay policyholders, which would be a big deal. They need to get a lot of reinsurance to do this deal. You can see that there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he had something up there about that. Yeah. That was a big part of the, uh, way to handle this. Um, I mean, because if you look from the numbers that we just said, as long as Geico's loss ratio wasn't, you know, I mean, there, there would be return on investments too. So as long as their loss ratio wasn't like 90% or something, you would be profitable pretty quickly. I mean, I don't know exactly where rates and everything were in 1976 when they were looking at this, but Presumably, you would have been able to make well over 5%. Um, so, yeah, I would say given their expense ratio and everything, you'd have to be losing $0.90 cents on every dollar that you wrote to not have some earnings eventually. 
So it's just a question of like, you know, underwriting the right things, getting reinsurance and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, premiums written in 1976 when Buffett bought in to Geico was 463 million. And then 1978, 620 million and 1990, I'm sorry, 1980, uh, 638 million. So, I mean, going from 1976 to two years later, they really wrote more premiums. Yeah. Um, and then you could look at the underwriting gain and loss by segment for Geico as well. Okay. So what was it? Negative 60 million in 1976. But right. Then, but then two years later, how yeah, much is it? 174 million. Right. So, I mean, this was definitely one of Berkshire's best investments. Mm -hmm. And he sized into it too, right? Yeah. And he wanted to do it really big. Um, I think to me, they're, they're just two kind of factors. I mean, he, he did it based on who he picked, right? But there was two factors, two risks that could be pretty big, right? It needed to be bailed out. It needed capital infusion. It would not be able to go on without that because regulators would shut it down. And then two, they just need to stop growing. As long as someone just said growth doesn't matter at all, you could turn it around and they could make a lot of money. They had a big advantage over other companies. They had shown how much they could make in the past, but they had to be committed to the idea of not growing. And in fact, shrinking initially. Um, if they had someone who's willing to do that, then they could turn it around and they'd be successful. The big part, of course, is the bailout aspect of it. That's the part where a lot of people, I think, wouldn't make the investment because of how risky that is of what if they don't bail them out? What if they don't, um, what if they completely shut down Geico? And there's no reason in a sense why they want it. Um, policyholders could be paid off. It's not, it's not like Geico's not something that's connected to a lot of other things in the economy. Insurers don't work that way, car insurers. Um, so it would have been perfectly fine to have that happen. Um, it would have been embarrassing for the industry, mm -hmm. certainly, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because a lot of people, when you think about Buffett, then maybe there's like some recency buys. It's like investing in Apple. It's investing in Coca-Cola, really hands-off situations. But mm -hmm. there's been a lot of investments in his career where it was bailout time and he like stepped in so i mean you could go to the financial crisis and talk about some of those investments but you know right. like um not necessarily like there was a bailout needed for american express but i mean he definitely bought when there was blood in in the streets um geico very similar situation and you could talk about what he did with goldman sachs or solomon brothers yeah i mean know? yeah every time every time i invest in a company that just lost money for the first time i probably done really really well and the reason for that is you're not it depends on the person, but so let's say someone like Buffett is not going to make an investment like this in something unless he's getting an amazing deal because he understands the value of it over time. Um, what we're talking about, what, this franchise and what's intact here. This was not a deterioration in the competitive position of the company at all. That's an important thing to understand. It wasn't industry trends were negative, really, for the long run, you know? Mm -hmm. um, this is a business that's still around today in much the same form. Um, what it was is mistakes that the company made and Buffett understands things like insurance really well. And so he understood what he was looking at and how this company was run and what it could be like. Um, the bailout part of it is, is interesting that he was willing to have so much confidence in that or not necessarily so much confidence because maybe the upside was so big that he was willing to possibly lose everything. But um, the management thing is more understandable. He talked to him for a while, got a good feel for him. Um, but the, the bailout thing that they, people would go through with this and do it uh, might have been harder for him to... I mean, I think it would have been harder for someone who wasn't Buffett to make the investment because of that, because the capital was insufficient. I mean, it just was not a strong enough position. Geico had been pretty highly leveraged going into it, so it would have been really hard to make investment like that. Yeah. yeah. You, one of your, my favorite articles that you've ever written was about gross profits and learning to move up the income statement. And in that article, you talked about basically like everything below the gross profit line teaches you a lot about management. Everything above the gross profit line teaches you a lot about like the actual business itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like you take a situation where it's like their competitive position hasn't deteriorated, like you just said, and maybe it's much more of a, strategy shift and how they're going to run their business it's almost like that could produce you know an interesting opportunity and I, I imagine that's what it was like when you invested in a company that lost money for the first time is it because like the market just all of a sudden forgets about it, it or you know punishes the stock etc and then they just change it from there or what was that situation like for you 
Yeah, exactly. So it's a loss that you don't think has to do with the competitive position. So examples would be a uh, launch of a product that flops, right? One product, you launch it, it flops. You spend a lot of money on it. One project for a defense contractor or something. Um, one movie that you put out. Um, fraud, right? Uh, an adventure into a different line of insurance or banking that you hadn't done before and that you promised we're shutting it down and we're going to go back to what we were doing before. I mean, if you think about it, Geico's numbers probably on their preferred risk um, customers were fine, which is what its business was before. So it's as if they started up a new business, lost huge amounts of money, and then said, let's shut it down, go back to what we were doing before. How often do you see that happen in companies all the time? Um, I do see it a lot more so with like financial companies and things like that because they'll shut it down and admit it was a mistake and stuff and part of that is regulars will tell them you have to and all that and they have to recognize what it is mm. for other kinds of companies it gets buried a lot more um i mean i talked to a ceo and he's like well the opportunity was so great that i just had to see it through it didn't work but i had to see it through and now he's talking about how they're kind of back to their their roots i guess you could say the foundation and just focusing on that yeah, and, and, I, and understandably, yeah. I mean, like, how do you fault someone if you understand the situation? You're like, yeah, I, I see how that could have been very big and important and that you were going to focus on that. Yeah, you know, um, I think Geico, I think you could fault Geico and most of these companies from not using common sense. Um, a company that's has that amount of underwriting leverage can't move into anything that they don't have a huge amount of experience in it's not safe at all and i mean that's sort of a general thing with financial products financial innovation a rapid move to in have innovative products leads to potentially really big problems because you don't have sufficient loss experience in the past to understand what you're doing mm -hmm. and you have to use a lot of common sense to figure that out so like when we talk about banks we talk about the loans to deposits and all that kind of stuff if it's all loans that you've been making the same kind of loans forever that's different than a third of these loans are something that you haven't made in the past and don't really understand necessarily that well. Um, it would become a much bigger deal. But a company that's not having much leverage, right, could experiment a little bit more and then slowly ramp it up if they realize that what our experience is. But what was Geico's experience in understanding what non-preferred um, risk customers were like? It wasn't high, mm -hmm. you know? And they had their history, and this is what happens with a lot of companies, their history of not losing money, of making money consistently. That's why regulators probably let them underwrite um, at the levels that they did. Um, they thought we're Geico, we're successful all the time and stuff, and they didn't think about, oh, wait, we're doing something that's completely different than what we did before, right? Just because you've successfully made mortgage loans for a really long time doesn't mean, okay, now we can do hotel loans and we'll have the C same sort of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You don't have any knowledge of that sort of thing. And the fact that you were successful in something else doesn't really transfer over, but it does create a halo effect around you. And that often can mean that other people don't call you out and warn you about what you're doing. Buffett did though. I mean, he not only stock and stuff, apparently like actually made an effort to tell them your reserves are insufficient. Slow down, you know? Mm -hmm. No, it's fascinating because there's uh, old clips of them at the Berkshire meetings talking about banks and why banks fail. And it's very much the same thing that you just talked about because he was talking about they just get in trouble on the asset side and they go crazy and they start making loans that, you know, they chase yield or whatever. And then it becomes an issue for them. They go into a different business that they haven't, they have zero experience in. Right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times... <sighs> So because of the way that these companies report and all that, you'll see a lag where it seems like the, the, the soft signs of what's going wrong should be obvious really early. So it's really a failure of common sense when you have these sorts of situations happen. Um, it's not so much a failure based on the numbers because you can kind of make up whatever numbers initially for the first few years to justify how your, um, your loss experience is going to be. Um, and then until those numbers show up, you just, you aren't doing the right things. So you're a little slow to respond to it. Whereas if Geico had known that earlier, responded sooner, they might have less of a problem. Um, and then the added thing with Geico, and this is true with the financial things you were talking about with banks and stuff, is a past history of success allows them to take more risk than other people might have. 
I don't believe that a new car insurer set up in 1970, uh, whenever they started doing this, uh, in the early 70s, let's say, would ever have been able to under uh, to write as many premiums relative to their capital surplus as Geico did. I think it was because they were Geico that they were allowed to, and that and because they were Geico, they believed they'd be able to do that. They also were growth stock and stuff like that too. You know that that kind of puts pressure on people sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1979, Berkshire purchased an additional 461,900 shares of Geico at an average cost of ten dollars and twenty nine cents per share. By this time, Berkshire had invested $28.3 million into Geico and owned 26.8% of the company. Berkshire added to its position in Geico in 1980, buying almost $1.5 million more shares at an average cost of $12.82 per share. By the end of 1980, Berkshire owned 35.5% of Geico at a total cost of $47.1 million. After returning to consistent profitability... This is great when this happens. Mm. Geico used excess cash flow to repurchase stock. This meant that Berkshire's ownership of Geico increased to 38% by the end of 1985. It's actually a huge increase that they had, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really smart because they had nothing else that they could do with it. So they just stuck into the business that they had there. Now, since Berkshire took it over, they've changed a little bit, I think, in advertising very, very heavily and growing their market share more. As opposed to in the past when Berkshire was just a minority investor in the company, they focused on buying back their own stock. Why do you think that is? Because capital requirements and stuff like that at Berkshire? I, I think Buffett doesn't care that they um, that it hurts earnings severely. Mm-hmm. So for an insurance company to advertise a lot, with which Geico and Progressive both do, they are huge advertisers, it's extremely harmful to earnings. Because new business is a losing proposition even if – it, even absent the marketing issues, there's it's not as profitable to have new business as old business. Um, in the long run, it's profitable, but a lot of your costs are up front, and um, some things have to do with loss stuff, and things are even a little bit higher too. Um, so everything about it is going to be more risky at first to have the to your current period earnings to add someone as a policyholder, right? Um, but in the long run, it's going to pay off. And then you add the marketing part to it. Marketing costs are extremely high in things like insurance in terms of customer acquisition versus the amount of money you make in the first period. Uh, but over the lifetime, the value of the customer is extremely high. Yeah, because right? what are the retention rates at a at Geico or like Progressive? 95 Well, Geico's percent? are higher. Yeah. That's the other thing. So preferred customers. So actually, this underestimates expenses. I didn't get into that. But Geico and Progressive, they report their expenses and things like that. And we just did their expense ratio. The expense ratio for Geico actually under reports the um, true expense that the company has because actually uh, preferred risk customers are more likely to stick with them over time. This gets into the issue of by judging one part of a person's life, you can see all sort of different risk elements in their whole life. Um, an advantage to people like government employees, members of the military, preferred risk stuff we're talking about, is just writing preferred risk, you're going to retain more people. They're more likely to be a homeowner. They're more likely to be married. Um, uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas progressive, their people are more like that they're writing uh, are more likely to be renters. They're less likely to be married. Um, different factors that just cause a lot more change in their life. There are certain people who change things a lot and some people change things a lot less. People who change a lot less, who tend to be lower risk anyway, um, are also going to be more profitable for you. It's a lot more profitable to pursue business that is going to be retained at a higher rate. And so in certain segments of Geico versus Progressive, I would estimate Geico's retention rate is 15 points higher. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. Well, that's why Progressive is bundling everything and stuff now Mm -hmm. because they want to get that number up. Um, they don't have any interest in actually writing like renters insurance and, and homeowners and stuff. They just want to bundle it to retain people. They yeah. lock you in. It's like when a bank, you have your bank account there, you have your mortgage through them, you have. Yeah. So that's another good example. Them, so sort of initially like getting a checking account for someone is not an advantage to a bank, right? Someone puts in $500 to fund the account or something. This is not, it, they cost too much to gain the person. Um, some number of the people, maybe a third of them or whatever, are going to leave in the first year. But if you can get past that into year two and stuff, once they've stuck with you for a year, they're unlikely to leave you. And over time, whatever business they do is likely to go up. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I know people who literally from the 1970s was probably the first time they got insurance through some agent or something. And they're using the same company and for more policies over time. Right. So that's a big advantage is in insurance because people often use the same insurer over time. So you have this high marketing cost at first. 
it's very harmful though to the earnings of the company to either of those high marketing costs um so i mean if you just want to report higher period earnings you buy a lot of bonds not a lot of stocks and you um advertise less and those sorts of things and then you have higher earnings in the current period then i don't think buffett cares about that and then berkshire eventually acquired the rest of geico 1996 so this gives you an idea he likes this deal too but how much more did he pay for the other part so what did he pay total for the uh um, let's see. So he ended up paying when you do the buyback and everything, he got 38% or so of the company. Well, actually it was even more than that. It was close to half of it for 50 million. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the end of 1980 Berkshire owned 35.5% of Geico at a total cost of 47.1 million. Yeah. Okay. And how much did he pay for the other 50%? Yeah. That should be lower. Um, in 1996. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta pull that up. Let's see. Two point three billion. Yeah. So it gives you some idea of um, how good a deal it was. Yeah, Warren e. Buffett is returning his focus to one of his earliest successes, Berkshire Hathaway Inc., which he controls, announced a two point three billion cash offer yesterday to buy the forty nine percent of the Geico Corporation it does not already own. Yeah. So you have some idea of how good that return was over, what was it, 20 uh, years, right? Uh, you had a return that was whatever that is, 40 times or something probably for the initial investment. And then there would have been some dividends too, not a lot, but some. It'd be interesting to do a keg around that original $10,000 to the present. Yeah, it was a good, I mean, we. it's not, you could figure out how to, what the return was. It was good. It was very good. And it was a meaningful investment too. It was at the time for Berkshire that wasn't a small investment. Um, so to make a very big investment like that, and he had wanted to do even more actually. So I love this typical Buffett. In yesterday's announcement, Mr. Buffett did not elaborate on his views of Geico or the auto insurance business in general, except to say that he was happy with the old investment and equally comfortable with the new purchase. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's been a success for them i mean he gives some estimates of it well we could figure out i mean so what's progressive at you can use quick app pass to figure out let's pull up quick app pass. we don't know all the details of geico and stuff but i su- suspect that they are fairly comparable so market cap market capitalizations 56.4 billion yeah and berkshire presumably hasn't been putting capital downstream to geico and how much did he buy it for in the 1990s um, 2.4 billion. Yeah. It's probably worth 50 billion now. That's not unreasonable that it might be in that range. Uh, I mean, it depends on factors of like what they actually hold in the insurance mm-hmm. company and stuff. But I mean, just looking at it, if we try to separate it out from what they really hold versus like what Berkshire's do, what they hold just because Ber- Berkshire's overcapitalized, um, that that's probably right. So he's up another 20, uh, 20 or 25 times or whatever. And since then, well, after being up 40 or years. whatever, the first, mm-hmm. yeah, 20 years. Crazy. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button both on the podcast and the YouTube side of things. I'm going to put Jacob McDonough's information, as always, in the description. So be sure to check it out. Check out his book, Capital Allocation. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us, and we will see you in the next podcast.